Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I assume most of you know who I am, but just in case, uh, I'm Dan Walsh. I'm the county sheriff. Uh, the gentleman running all the electronics is Chief Deputy Alan Jones. On my right, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Leon Evans. He's from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, he runs the Restoration Center. Uh, on his right is Mr. Peter Tracy with the Mental Health Board. Uh, I've got to thank him. Uh, he has been very, he and their board has been very instrumental in, in getting Mr. Evans up here and in some other projects that we're working on. Uh, I'm going to not spoil any of your thunder. I'll let you talk about your program. Uh, but we have applied for, we, the Sheriff's Office, uh, working with Mental Health, have applied for several grants along the lines of what Mr. Evans is going to talk about. Um, basically, just to give you a, a thumbnail sketch, what we're interested in, uh, I, I call it a one shop for all the services. We don't have that in our, in our county. We've got places that specialize in addiction abuse. We've got community elements. We've got the hospitals that take care of medical issues and some addiction issues. Uh, we've got a, a mental health ward in one of the hospitals. But we don't have one place where, where most people can get a full range of services that they need. Uh, part of this is self-interest, the sheriff's office and the jail. Uh, we want to reduce some of the minor offenders that are coming into jail. I want to give my deputies and the, the law enforcement officers out in the street options besides doing nothing or taking people to jail. Uh, we don't have anything like what Mr. Evans is going to talk about. It's something that we will hopefully build into over time. My personal hope is that if we can get it built, it will not only serve law enforcement, but it would be the kind of thing if, if, if I've got a a teenage son who was start, starting into a mental health crisis, I could take him to this place and know that he would get prompt service. If he needs a psychotropic drug, there would be a psychiatrist who can give it to him right away. If he needs referral then for more counseling and things like that, it wouldn't be the kind of thing where he would have to wait, you know, three months to get in. It, it would hopefully be a much more seamless thing. And as those of you folks know that, you know, anytime we deal with these, with these people, the homelessness, the, the mental health, the addiction, these things are so interrelated, it is very rare we have somebody that we deal with that has only one issue. Most of them have multiple issues combined with severe uh, medical uh, issues. I, I want to say one other thing, then I'll turn it over to you. Uh, you call it a restoration center. Uh, I have referred to it, and so has law enforcement, as a community resource center. Uh, other places have called it an adult assessment center. We're all talking the same thing, a one shop fits all, does a lot of things. So I will turn it over to you, and thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sheriff, and I know the Sheriff and the, the Chief and the uh, Chairman of the County Board and the Chairman of the Mill Health Board. This is about the second or third time they've heard this, so uh, I apologize for the, the, uh, 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 the repeating the same thing over, but uh, our story is compelling uh, in the fact that we come from a community and a state that uh, they, they don't fund mental health and substance abuse services very well. And a lot of people, because they never get to treatment, end up in the wrong places. They end up in emergency rooms, they end up homeless, uh, many of them end up in jail. And uh, you know, e even the youth who don't get uh, the proper kinds of assessments and diagnosis end up kind of on the wrong path. And, and uh, we'll talk a lot about that as we go on. So I'm, I want to talk to you about a community solution to a terrible problem, but I'm also going to talk to you about the barriers. So let me tell you a little bit about this, this program. Uh, we uh, uh, started in 2000, that's when I went there. I was the state director of the Texas Department of Mental Health and Mental Retardation, and I worked closely with the Texas criminal justice system and was made painfully aware of all the people that ended up in the Texas prison. Uh, mainly because they had an illness, you know, and uh, it was uh, very expensive, and I'm going to talk to you in a little bit how I can prove to you that treatment works, but not through my data, but actually the data supplied by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. So, uh, you know, I'm going to take you through this journey, but it's a journey about how a community came together and started identifying problems and brainstorming about what could be done with little or no money to begin with, and so we had to prioritize. We, you know, since we didn't have any money, once we started coming together and identify the problem, we had to decide what we wanted to do first. Then we had to decide what we wanted to do second. We found lots of things we couldn't fund, so we'd put it on a parking lot and say, this is critical, we've got to find a way to fund it. And sooner or later, 
we found ways to do that. So when you hear what I'm going to tell you today, you're going to be overwhelmed. You're going to say, we can never do that. We can never have all these programs and all these services, and they got all these uh, 100 different funding sources, and everybody works together, and they're kind of on the same page. Well, we didn't, you know. Uh, uh, we, we, you know, uh, we didn't have the same mission. We didn't say have the same cause. Everybody was underfunded and overworked. And everybody, you know, when you start talking about these issues, thought, well, you know, they're trying to cost shift on me or they're trying to get my money or my staff. And so there's all these natural fears about coming together and sharing and, and uh, actually, you know, uh, making things work. So over a period of time, uh, we got to trust each other as a community. Uh, we uh, have a very open forum. Oh, I'm sorry. Got to be louder. Uh, we we uh, uh, have an open forum. We collected a lot of data on cost and outcomes. Uh, we have community collaborations where uh, we have families and consumers and law enforcement officers and hospitals and medical providers and EMS and you kind of go on and on and on who come together monthly and look at this data on what's working and not working. And if something doesn't work, we change it. And so uh, everything's pretty transparent. Pete has a lot of the, the data on, on uh, cost and outcomes that we share with that group. And I'm going to share a lot of it with you today. So this is not to make you feel bad like, you know, why aren't we doing all this stuff? You know, they're, they're doing it in Bear County. Uh, you know, the, the issue uh, really is, is about how you come together as a community and solve this problem. I've had a chance to meet with most of your leadership here, the county board, the mental health board. Of course, the sheriff, the chief, uh, this great guy sitting beside me. Uh, you know, you, you have uh, great services here. You have a, a, a will to do the right thing. And it's really about, you know, how you improve the public safety net. Uh, you provide value for taxpayers' dollars. And to me, value is a relationship between cost and outcomes. And you have a very open and transparent process. Now, you accepted the affordable health care dollars, you know, here, uh, you know, uh, just three weeks ago because of Senator Kennedy and his son Patrick worked for like eight or nine years in Congress to get the mental health and substance use parity bill passed. It passed. CMS, which is the Federal Medicaid and Medicare Administration, is starting to figure out that parity bill basically says you have to treat mental illness and substance abuse like any other disease. And insurance companies never have done that before. They've always not funded, find ways not funded, or they would only pay half of the cost for outpatient treatment. You know, those kind of things. So what uh, CMS is finding out is even state Medicaid uh, departments aren't funding these services like they should. And most of the people we're talking about today are people who are probably going to be eligible for, their, for the Affordable Health Care Act in your community, so they will have a funding source if you, if you can put together the right kinds of services. Now, if the only tool you got is a hammer, everything's going to look like a nail, right? And so if, if the only solutions you have to solving these problems is inpatient stays, jail, you know, uh, more intense uh, kinds of services, then uh, you're not going to find the right solution. So one of the things we're going to talk about a lot is uh, supports and services that really are effective that don't cost near as much as those more expensive alternatives. So we have a lot of tools in our tool belt, and we continue to develop more tools because people are different. They need different kinds of supports. So, uh, Chief, uh, we're going to start off by showing you a, a little film. Uh, it's called Roll Call. It's all done by law enforcement. Uh, when we first started this, uh, like the sheriff said, uh, we had this little restoration center, and it's a place where people can go and get you know, health and healing and, and some hope. And so we didn't call it a crisis center. We didn't want it to sound like a jail or, or you know, the traditional stuff. Cause so it's called the Restoration Center. And, uh, you know, uh, we have a culture there of health and healing. And uh, so amazing things happen. And uh, so we started off with 1,100 a month going through that program, mainly bought, brought by law enforcement officers and family members and some consumers will walk in too. We did this video and started showing it at the, the academies, both the, the, the police academy and the sheriff's academy. And we take it to each one of the police and sheriff's substations quarterly and show it on all three shifts. So today we have 2,300 people a month who are brought to this facility.
for, for evaluation and treatment. They used to go to jail or emergency rooms or put back on the, on the streets or homeless. And our, our, our biggest and greatest partners are really law enforcement officers. And they've gone to having attitudes like, I'm a cop, I'm not a social worker, I don't believe in these hug a thug programs, to where they actually send the people they assist and get to treatment actually doing well and they're not having to you know, interact with them over and over again. So some of our best advocates and supporters of you know, uh, health and healing and caring is, is, is our uh, brothers and sisters in blue. So you know, show this, Chief. So uh, we uh, we we've you know we don't have a lot of money like y'all don't have money. So we want to make sure that the dollars we do spend are spent in the right place in the right reason. So we actually have four intervention points to try to keep people from being criminalized, and uh, the same people are people that end up homeless on the streets and and in and out of emergency rooms inappropriately. So we were in the second round of the SAMHSA jail diversion grants, and there were three rounds. Everybody that applied that was funded, they all decided they put somebody in jail to identify people with mental illness and try to endear themselves and get them into treatment when they got out so they wouldn't decompensate and be right back in that vicious revolving door. Uh, our community had this community collaboration and we had consumers and family members on the group. And even before we wrote the grants, we, we developed some values. And one of the values we had is you shouldn't have to go to jail if you have an illness. And many times the, the reason people do go to jail is because there aren't alternatives and public safety is paramount. And if you're potentially in danger yourself or others, then law enforcement officers have to do that. Now, it's a sad case here in the United States that the public mental health system has been so decimated over the years and so poorly funded in that we've basically shut all of our state hospital beds 
there really aren't resources available, so you know the alternatives are the ones we just talked about. So uh, our second intervention point is one that we're working with the Council of Governments on right now in the county. And a lot of people are still slipping through the safety net on that first line diversion. And so uh, the county has actually paid us and we have staff at bookend before somebody goes to jail. We're doing mental health assessments and we also have access to the state database. So if you've ever been treated in one of the public mental health hospitals in Texas, or one of these community mental health centers, then you're in the database. So we cross match with that. We're, all, we're doing a mental health assessment. We also do a dangerousness assessment. So if it pops up that you have a severe mental illness and you also go very low on potentially being dangerous to yourself or others, we're talking to the judge, the magistrate, saying, hey, judge, please don't put this person in jail. Do a conditional release. Tell the person, I'm not going to put you in jail, but you need to go with these folks and get some treatment and some help. And so we're, we're at that point right now where that's just being you know, kicked off and I, I, that's our second intervention point. We too have some staff that work with the jail staff, the healthcare staff in jail, to try and endear ourselves and get them into treatment when they get out. Because there will be people who commit crimes that law enforcement just can't look past. I mean, the crime's gonna be bad enough they need to go to jail. But sooner or later they're gonna get out of jail and they need to get to treatment or they're probably going to decompensate and, and be in that vicious revolving door that we that I keep mentioning. Then the last point is probably one of the most important parts and we probably have providers in the room and family members and uh, I don't know if you all have read P Pete Early's book it's called Crazy and it's not it's not about Pete's son who had a severe mental illness but it's about the judicial system and uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit uh, about Pete so uh, Pete's a writer, I think he was a health uh, writer for the Washington Post for a long time, then he started writing books. And anyway, his son went off to college and he had his first psychotic break and he was walking down the street uh, in the university town, this is a university town, and he saw a house and he thought that house was his family house. So he went inside and he took a bubble bath. Well, the family came home and, you know, they were, you know, you know, freaked out, you know, so some, it's like the three bears who's been sleeping in my chair, you know, who's been taking a bubble bath. And, and so they find this naked college student taking a bubble bath and they walk in on him and he's demanding that they get out of his house. Well, there's a confrontation, they call the police, the police show up, the kids, uh, you know, confrontational, the law enforcement officer doesn't, hasn't been trained and talked down in de-escalation techniques. So things get bad and, you know, basically, he gets a hard takedown, pretty much gets beat up, he gets taken to jail. Then, you know, he comes home because he's very ill. He doesn't know he's sick. He doesn't think he's sick, so he refuses to treat me. He's locked himself in his room, and, you know, he's screaming. His parents' hearts are being broken. They want to get him to help. He refuses help. So they call up the mental health authority and the police and, and different people, and they say, my son needs help. Will you come and help him? And they say, was he willing to get help? No. Was he endangering himself or others? Uh, I don't know, I don't think so. Well, I'm sorry, call us back when he is. So the family actually made a story up that the kid punched his mother or pushed his mother. So the law enforcement officers show up, they don't have resources, the kid gets arrested again, and the same thing happens. You know, he basically has this hard takedown and, and uh, you know, never gets to treatment or help. So uh, the, you know, the system is disconnected. In, in terrible ways. So that's one of the things we've kind of come together in our community. So there are a lot of people who don't know they're ill. You probably have family members. They don't think they're ill. They don't want treatment. Uh, a lot of them are self-medicating with alcohol and drugs and it presents its own problem. And they become estranged from their families and they don't take their medication and they don't see their doctor. And so they get caught up in this, this vicious, uh, terrible uh, cycle. And so the, the last place that we support are the problem solving courts, okay? So, you know, uh, these, these people, a lot of times, you know, if they're left to their own devices, aren't gonna go to treatment, they're not gonna take their medication, but if they're diverted to a mental health court, a veterans court, a, a drug and alcohol court, a children's court, in the condition of you not going to jail or prison as you get into treatment and you got a judge sitting in front of you with a black robe saying, 
you know, you know, and treating you nice, but saying, you know, hey, you know, you go to treatment or, or you, you have these, these uh, you know, uh, bad outcomes are going to happen to you, uh, that, that black rub effect really works. I mean, it's kind of amazing. So these programs really work, and, and it's a way to get people into treatment in the first place. Once they get into treatment, then they start getting lucid, and they start making better, you know, decisions for themselves, and they start understanding they have an illness and how they can manage it, and you can get to the point where you can, you can, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, educate them about their illness and, and hook them up with the proper kinds of supports. <clears throat> and we've even done it on the civil side. So uh, uh, I don't know if most of you know about New York's Kendra's Law. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Kendra was a, a lady that got pushed uh, under a subway in uh, Grand Central Station. And the guy that pushed her under the subway had a long history of mental illness. He would go to Rikers Island, get medication, get treated, get, get uh, lucid, and so, of course, they had to release him. Then he panhandled outside Grand Central Station, and he you know, refused to take his medication and see the doctor. And when he was sick, he was violent. In fact, the people who lived around there would walk all the way around Grand Central Station so they didn't have to walk in front of him because he was, you know, he wanted money and he wanted this and that and the other. So one winter, he was in the... Uh, uh, in uh, Grand Central Station, saw this lady named Kendra, and he thought she was a demon, and he pushed her underneath an oncoming train, and of course it killed her. But when the public found out about it, they were outraged the fact that everybody knew this guy was sick, everybody knew that he was potentially dangerous, and uh, but there was no public solution for it. So they passed a law that basically said on the civil side, not the criminal justice side, if a judge knows somebody <coughs> has been committed on several occasions and tends not to be uh, compliant with treatment when they get out of the state hospital, a judge can, can order them to take their medication, see the doctor, and generally stay in compliance with their treatment. If they don't, the judge can put them back in the mental hospital even if they're not blatantly or fortly psychotic and danger themselves or others. So uh, I went to our judge in our community, uh, Judge Polly Jackson Spencer, and I said, who does the civil commitments, I said, Judge, why don't you use the kinder law and she said, well, Leon, I'm a judge. I'm not a mental health professional. What would I, you know, order them to do? And how would I know her they were in compliance? So uh, I offered to find money for a caseworker to work for her that could work with our staff, develop a treatment plan, then get back with the judge on compliance. And in Texas, the, the bill was really watered down. You had to have 60 consecutive days in the state hospital to even be eligible for this outpatient uh, commitment process. And so uh, I think we had a cohort of about uh, 150 people or so who would be eligible for this. And uh, so we started working with the judge, and the process would go something like this. Uh, a person would go before the judge, and she would say, Leon, and she's got her robes on, and she's very kind, and but, you know, insistent. And she said, Leon, you know, you've been in and out of the state hospital most of your adult life. Your illness has been so painful for your family and friends. You know, you don't have relationships anymore. Uh, you know, I don't want to see you dying in the state hospital. I want you to get a life back. So I'm asking this lady over here, Mary Helen Lopez, to work with you and the Center for Healthcare Services to develop you a specialized plan, and I expect you to, to abide by it. And it was like magic. We actually uh, did research with the, the med school or, or uh, 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 one of the universities on this, and we had a 67 predict, uh, 67 percent reduction in rehospitalization. Then these are people that have spent almost all their life in a state hospital, so that black robe work effect works. So you know, it's just how do you engage people? How do you get them in treatment when they don't want to be treated and are treatment resistant? And these are some of the very f folks that are the most fragile and, and most ill. So that's one of the things we kind of learned in this process that, that's worked well for us. And those are the very people that end up costing the most, uh, not only to themselves and their family, but to society. The average severely mentally ill person, I'm not even using my slides, I'm sorry, Chief. Uh, the average um, uh, mentally ill person in the United States dies 25 years sooner than the general population because uh, they're not only mentally ill, but they're self-medicating with alcohol and drugs. Most of them are smoking because there's some settling effects to smoking somehow. Uh, they never get to primary care. If they got to primary care, they wouldn't be welcome because they have these strange behaviors. A lot of them have hygiene problems, and so they wouldn't go back. And uh, I was telling the, you know, the, the 
the uh, uh, county uh, uh, administrators or county leaders earlier today, these are the very folks that recently we're starting to learn a lot about. So we wonder why the cost of health care has gone up so fast in the United States. And it's because of what they call disease burden is one of the main reasons. And so the World Health Organization, the <coughs> National Institute of Health, but more importantly, Washington State University in the last few years, uh, Bill Gates has funded a research division there because his foundation is trying to uh, look at global diseases and what he wants to fend, spend his money on to, to uh, prevent uh, uh, preventable diseases and actually uh, improve uh, life and longevity and, and health and productivity. And so uh, uh, four to five of the diseases that actually cost society the most money in actual health care cost and lost productivity are mental illnesses and substance abuse problems. You know, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, some of you have written his books, I mean read his books, The Tipping Point and some others. His mother was a psychiatric nurse in, in uh, Canada, and so he was the health and science editor for the Washington Post one time, so he's very interested in this. And he actually did research and wrote an article for the New Yorker, which is called Million Dollar Murray, where he explains that these people not only live short lives, they're non-productive, but when they do die, they're because of all these unhealthy habits, they're dying of congestive heart failure, liver disease, and they're million dollar patients. And of course, they're unfunded. So, you know, when you go to a hospital and you're unfunded and it costs a million dollars, they tend to raise their prices and insurance companies raise their prices and, you know, you can, you can see the effects. So, uh, you know, I'll talk to you about primary care in a little bit and what we're doing for, to do early intervention and prevention with, with this group and a, kind of a holistic approach. Um, CMS, now, you know, uh, you all accepted affordable health care dollars. Um, uh, you want to go to that film where it, calls, it talks about the triple aim, the slide? Right there. So uh, how health insurance companies uh, used to pay and how Medicaid pays, and a lot of people pay, they pay for uh, units of service. They, they pay for a, a 15 minutes for a doctor's visit or 30 minutes. They pay for x-rays. They pay for lab work. Uh, they pay for all kinds of things except for outcomes, Okay. And that's one another reason why they're driving up the cost of health care, because people are, are kind of in this meal churning out these events and really not thinking about what's going to actually improve somebody's health. And so the, the, uh, one of the heads of CMS came up with this triple aim and said, our dollars that are funded by the federal government in the future have to start doing three things. They have to start improving the patient experience and outcomes for people and they have to drive down the cost of health care, okay? And so they're actually now starting to implement that. So your local hospitals, if they have high readmission rates, they're losing 1% of their Medicare funding, okay? Your state Medicaid departments, the ones that are contracting with the MCOs, they also will start getting penalized if they don't have good uh, health outcomes. And so, you know, this is kind of a perfect time for you as a community to start sitting down with your, your uh, 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 hospitals, your health community, with the, you know, the sheriff's, you know, great leader here. You've got county leadership here. And start talking about how do we braid and integrate local, state, and federal dollars where you concentrate on actually having better outcomes and better patient experience and reducing the cost of health care and actually making a difference, you know. And we talked earlier about uh, public dollars, in my mind, should produce value for the public and not units of service. And value, in my mind, is a relationship to what it costs and the outcome. And one of the things we've tried to do in Bear County, uh, where I am in, in San Antonio, is really kind of concentrate on those outcomes. And uh, Pete's got uh, a bunch of uh, reports, I think they may have been in your packet, that kind of look at the things that we evaluate. You know, so we look at people, are they going back to jail? Are they being hospitalized? You know, are we on drive-by? What are the wait times? You know, the, you know, on and on and on. And we have a, uh, an uh, additional uh, parallel group that's working on children's uh, issues for, ki for kids in, in crisis. So you want to go to the next one? So I don't want to lecture to you all. If you have questions, raise your hand, because this is, 
really about you and your community and not what we've done in, in Bear County. I, I do want to say again that uh, our success has to do with our community collaboration. And uh, uh, I was uh, telling the group earlier, uh, when I was the state director, I uh, actually funded some pilots to try to get people to work together. And I spent a lot of money, and uh, these, these areas in Texas I funded, uh, spent a lot of money on consultants, developed beautiful plans, but when it got down to operating, you know, the CEOs of those different organizations say, hey, that's a great plan, but not with my money or my staff. You know, so uh, 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 when I left the state, I got tired of being a state bureaucrat. I, I did a lot of good stuff when I was the state director. And, uh, but I, what I wanted to do was make a, a big difference in Bear County. And I knew that if I tried to call together the chief, uh, the sheriff, the police chief, hospital administrators, uh, other kinds of leaders in the community and start talking about this problem, uh, everybody uh, would have thought that I was trying to get in their pocket or I was trying to do something. Uh, and who was I? I have no power. So the, the people that can make decisions wouldn't have shown up if anybody had shown up at all. So I went to talk to our county judge, who was the mayor before that, and was the state senator before that, and I said, Judge, you know, this is a big problem in our community. The, the county's biggest responsibility is the jail. You've got a lot of people inappropriately uh, in jail. And by the way, I don't think you have a lot of people inappropriately in jail here like we had. I, I know that, you know, in our community, we had lots of people that uh, aren't in your jails uh, that were in our jail to begin with. And uh, you're, you know, from where we started, you, you guys are, are uh, way ahead of where we were. I just want to, you know, say that. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I told the judge, if I tried to bring people together, people would show up that could say no to a good plan and not say yes. And I asked him if he would champion, you know, this cause and make people come together and at least start talking about it. And he's very smart, and he said yes. And he not only did that, but he got the mayor to co-sign the letter. And when all these important people showed up, he's the one that challenged the group to come together and start working together on this. And we were smart enough to put that judge I told you about, Polly Jackson Spencer. We put her in charge of our first little jail diversion committee. And so we'd meet monthly in her courtroom, and the Center for Healthcare Services would buy sandwiches, Pete, and uh, the, the Mental Health Authority. We did a lot of the research and, and whatever, but it gave us a chance to learn about each other and respect each other, learn each other's languages, learn each other's missions. So you, you saw these law enforcement officers, they, they are big mental health advocates. I can tell you the first crisis intervention training we did, every officer in the place, and, and the chief and I were talking about that last night, everybody in the place were forced to be there. I heard things like, I'm a cop, I'm not a social worker, I hate these hug-a-thug programs. And by the end of the week, when they went through the role playing, everybody's going, oh my goodness, I wish I'd had this training a long time ago. Because when law enforcement officers and the public are most at risk is when they go on a mental health call, or they go on a family disturbance call, or like we saw in Ferguson recently, some kind of highly emotional situation in the community. And if your officers, the only tools they have are their command voice and command presence, and you have somebody that's paranoid and you get in their face and start barking orders, people are going to get hurt. Law enforcement officers are going to get hurt. The mentally ill people are going to get shot. You know, we saw in Ferguson, you know, you know the, the community there, they were upset. And uh, law enforcement officers had body armor on and, and uh, you know, these armored vehicles, and they were screaming at the, the citizens. Well, things went bad, you know. So what you, you learn in this training is you learn to recognize this is not the typical situation as law enforcement that I'm in. There's something wrong with this person. They're taught to, to learn the, uh, the signs and symptoms of mental illness or, or highly uh, emotionally charged situation. They're also taught techniques to step back, use de-escalation, and talk down procedures, and it really works. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So they talk the person down. They take them you know, uh, to the appropriate place rather than the uh, officer getting hurt or somebody else getting hurt. So I got off on a tangent. Uh, Go, go ahead to the next slide. So the cost. So what, what is the cost of <coughs> having uh, people untreated who have severe mental illnesses or people who are uh, addicted? Uh, you know, I, I uh, can tell you the national studies used to say 16% of people in jails 
had mental illnesses, they were way off by at least 50%. In, 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 you know, in fact, 25% uh, of us sometime in our life will have a diagnosable mental illness. You know, mental illness is very prevalent. It just so, it just so happens most of us aren't diagnosed, so we're having marital problems. Uh, we're having problems with our kids. Uh, we're having problems at the job. Uh, we're self-medicating with alcohol and drugs. You know, we're unhappy people. We commit suicide. You know, more suicides committed than homicides by a long shot, three or four times more. Uh, so you got all these people in jail, in and out of jail, in the criminal justice system. That's fairly costly. Um, the homeless, you would think the homeless wouldn't be very expensive, right? The chronically and persistently homeless are people with mental illness and have alcohol, and or have alcohol and drug problems, usually co-occurring. If you Google cost to taxpayers of the homeless, you'll get all kinds of studies. I think the cheapest I saw was about $30,000 a year to taxpayers. You know, have lots of encounter with law enforcement officers. Many times they're in and out of jail. They're certainly in and out of emergencies all, emergency rooms all the time. And they also have these horrific diseases and die real early and, and uh, end up being million dollar patients. How about Child Protective Services? Is that a problem in your community? Do we have families who are abusing and neglecting their, their uh, children? Yeah, so I almost guarantee that uh, the majority of those people were abused and neglected children themselves. They never got any treatments, especially trauma-informed treatment. They're abusing their kids, so what do we do? We yank their kids out of their family. We give the, the child no treatment. And uh, a lot of times, you know, foster families are great. A lot of times they're not. Then when they get to be 18, 19, 20 years old, we kick them out. You know, they age out of foster care. Well, I don't know about you all and your children, but I have two very successful sons. One's a doctor, one's an international business guy. They're great dads. They've got beautiful families. But if my wife and I had kicked them out when they were 18 or 19 and, and cut them loose, you know, to be on their own, they probably wouldn't have done too well. So, you know, uh, we've got all these systems that cost a lot of money in uh, horrendous ways. And I don't want to talk about the emotional and family terms, uh, just financially to society. And so the programs that, you know, I want to talk to you about actually are ways to do early intervention prevention in disease management and in engagement and uh, making a difference in, in kind of turning, turning that around. So we've got a big problem. Would everybody agree to that? Yeah? Okay. So this is the, the intervention points I just talked to you about. So we train law enforcement officers and work with the public uh, so people, you know, get to treatment in the first place without going to jail or emergency rooms. Secondly, I told you that, you know, we're doing the, the screening uh, at bookend to try to divert people so that they don't go to jail. Third, we have people in jail who are there to work with the, the sheriff's department and the health provider in the jail to recognize people so hopefully we get them into treatment when they get out of jail. And lastly, we're, we're working uh, uh, closely with all the therapeutic courts and, uh, you know, the problem-solving courts. We also do a lot of other early intervention prevention stuff, like uh, you know, your community probably and a lot of your doctors and hospitals took advantage of the federal dollars for the health information exchanges. And so uh, in our community, we have one called HASA. So all the hospitals are linked together. And uh, one of the things we did is we uh, worked with the hospitals and uh, a lot of people with severe mental illness kind of get in different tracks. They get in kind of the legal track or they get in the state hospital mental health track or they get in the homeless track. And a lot of them actually get in to the emergency room at, at hospitals kind of track. That's where they feel comfortable and they actually have friends there and, and uh, end up in emergency rooms over and over again. So what we did is we looked at people that had three or more admissions in a quarter in emergency rooms that had severe mental illnesses and 150 people popped up. We worked with a, a foundation, Methodist Healthcare Ministries, to fund some intensive case workers who were trained in trauma-informed care and other kinds of motivational engagement. And we've had over a 50% reduction in hospital utiliza utilization with that group. Now remember, I just told you, hospitals are gonna start getting penalized for, for readmissions. And so, uh, yeah, I think we're gonna meet with uh, some of the medical community here tomorrow. But at some point, 
uh, because uh, how you pay and what you count drives behavior, this is going to start you know, coming to, to a head in your community. And so you'll have hospitals and managed care organizations who want these people not to be in and out of their hospitals all the time and their mercy rooms and find cheaper, more appropriate uh, alternatives for, to, to care. So I'm hoping that uh, you can find a way to blend those state, federal, and local dollars and come up with your own community solution. Um, again, I want to you know, reinforce the fact that it's the community that makes uh, our thing work. It's not all these programs or anything else. And uh, I was telling a group earlier, I've worked on my doctorate a couple of times, and I've been all but dissertation twice, but I keep getting these job offers that would pay me more than I had if I had my PhD. And I had two young sons, so I kept moving. But the, last, the first time I was working on my doctorate, I was uh, doing an individual reading course under the head of the child psychology department, Dr. Denny. And he said, Leon, do you want an A in my course? And I said, of course. He said, well, go out and research all the creative ways there are to, to teach high-risk kids how to read. And I said, what's that have to do with child psychology? And he said, oh, we'll talk about that too. Later I found out he just accepted a job for, uh, in the state of New York in their educational division to head up their, their gifted and talented program and also their, their at-risk program. And this was back in the 60s, and of course there were a lot of kids who you know, couldn't read that were you know, in, in uh, elementary school and middle school. And so I found a lady in California who, who uh, got one of those old bathtubs like her grandmothers used to have with the claws, and she painted it paisley, and she let the little kids get in that bathtub and read. And those kids did so much better than the other kids that were just like them in the other traditional at-risk reading classes. And there was a guy in New York who let the kids read fashion magazines, comic books, whatever, just so they had their nose in that book and learning, you know, something they were interested in. And those kids did so much better than the traditional classes. And it just dawned on me, it's not the method. It's that these people design that method, and they believe it's going to work, and they put so much energy in, have such high expectations, those kids are responding to, to, the, to, the, to the, the, the teacher, the, peer, the person that designed it. So that's what really works in Bear County. You know, so what I tell everybody, don't do what we do in Bear County. You come up with your own solution. You know, uh, you know and start where you can start. Uh, always, uh, 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 you know, I always say uh, under promise and, and over deliver. And uh, so we've been very successful. You know, we're, we try not to brag. We let the data speak for ourselves. Uh, we have this great continuous quality improvement environment. And so we actually take a lot of risk and we try things, and a lot of it doesn't work. And, but, you know, if, if you don't know if you've got a problem, then you can never fix it, right? So if it doesn't work, we try something else, and sooner or later we figure out something that will work. So uh, if, if you don't get any other kind of message today, it's really about your community coming together with the leadership and you know, designing a system that works for your community. Sure. Sure, I'll, I'll give you the example I gave earlier, which was the, the best one. <clears throat> so the f first thing, since we didn't have any money, the first thing our little group decided to do was do training of law enforcement officers. So we, uh, Harris County, the Houston Police Department had already gone through the crisis intervention training. We asked them to come over and do the initial training. And, uh, you know, in that training, I think I told you, none of the officers wanted to be there. And so uh, uh, then the police chief and the sheriff kind of got behind this. So we started training lots of officers. And, uh, you know, uh, and even if officers trained to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental illness, if they don't have an alternative to jail or emergency room, then they're still going to go to jail or emergency rooms. So our little group decided the next thing we need to do is having an alternative. Well, we knew that we couldn't fund like a, 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 emergency, a psychiatric emergency room because you have to have hospital credentials and, and TALA would kick in. So we thought we'd just do a little 23-hour assessment center where we didn't have all those rules that drove up the cost. Well, we did have psychiatrists and evaluation and staff, and I, you know, I think we started off with uh, six or eight beds. And so remember, we're keeping a lot of data on what's working and not working. 
So once we opened that unit up and had an alternative for law enforcement officers, and officers in Texas have discretion, so if they determine whatever they you got picked up for, uh, you'd be better off to go into treatment than jail, they could bring you to treatment and pretty much drop mm -hmm. you off. And so all of a sudden, we saw this increase in number of people going to our little crisis unit and a decrease in the number of people going to jail and emergency rooms. And the, the chair, at that point, we'd switched uh, uh, the chairmanship from that judge to emergency room doctor, Dr. Natal, who was the emergency room physician at the University Health System, which is a huge public hospital associated with our med school. And so, and he's still the chair of what's called the medical director of the roundtable. And so all of a sudden, we saw the data tilt a little bit. All of a sudden, more people started going back to the emergency room and uh, um, uh, less people are going to the crisis unit. More people are going to jail, less people are going to the crisis unit. So uh, uh, the law enforcement officer that really was behind pressing law enforcement is a guy named Harry Griffin. And uh, by the way, I didn't tell you this, Chief. When he retired, he was the deputy police chief, deputy police chief, because he went from captain to deputy police chief because his program was, was so successful. But Harry's to the right of Attila the Hun. He, he is the most hard-nosed SOB there is in the world. I don't know why he believed in this program, but he did. Maybe he had a family member with a mental illness or whatever, but, you know, he was on point. And so Dr. Natal was saying, you know, I don't understand why cops are starting to bring people back to the emergency room again. And Harry says to him, get their badge numbers. Okay, they all have badge numbers. So Harry went out to the substations, chased these guys down and said, why are you taking these people back to emergency rooms when you got this crisis unit over here? And here's what he heard. He heard that from time to time, our doctors, less than 3% of the time, haven't uh, 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 actually provided primary health care since they were residents. You know, they're psychiatrists. So a law enforcement officer would bring somebody in that had a history of congestive heart failure or, or liver disease or something. They would ask the officer, would you mind taking them to the emergency room and get medical clearance and bring them back? Well, it didn't take any time at all for this rumor to spread through all law enforcement officers. Don't take the people over to 7-Eleven East Josephine because they're just going to tell you to take them to the emergency room anyway. Law enforcement officers don't want to be taxi services, you know, taking people back and forth all over the place, and they don't want to take orders from somebody that's not their commander or, or, or within the rank. So the rumor on the street was don't even take them over there. So here's how we saw the problem. We, we identified that was a problem. It wasn't working real well all of a sudden. So the hospital had already seen a huge reduction in their cost of inappropriate, unfunded people going to their emergency room. So Dr. Natal got with the president of the hospital district, uh, George Hernandez. They had a building downtown in San Antonio that used to be the county hospital. They had converted into a huge outpatient program and a women's health center, and a well baby clinic, and they also had an urgent care clinic there. So they could do uh, you know uh, minor mi medical emergencies, but they also had x-rays and lab work. And they had a suite of offs, uh, a suite of, uh, it used to be beds in the hospital available. So we moved our little crisis unit in that suite, and all of a sudden we could do medical clearance and psych evals in the same place. Okay, so that's an example. You know, so you find that there's a problem. Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, that's all right. Okay, so let, let me take the tasers to begin with. <clears throat> so uh, this program became so successful that actually our new police chief, uh, uh, McManus, who just retired, uh, he wanted all his officers to go through the 40-hour training because to him it really wasn't about the mentally ill people. It was back, getting back to good community policing and having officers to have these skills, more skills than just their command voice, command presence. 
you know, because, you know, they interact with the public all the time, and what you learn in this role playing is, is how to de-escalate, you know, situations and, and deal with the public in not such a harsh way. So he actually requires all of his officers and his command staff to go through the 40-hour training and even put it in the academy. For a long time, he wouldn't let an officer carry a taser unless they had been through the training because he wanted them to use verbal intervention before force. Okay, so, you know, if you have to, you have to, but, you know, you, you know if you've got more tools in your tool bag, you should use the appropriate tool and not only use force as a last result. Uh, our, our sheriff, uh, who she's a, she is a retired two-star general who had a brother that uh, committed suicide and had a severe mental illness. She's seen, uh, and she also requires all of her field officers to go through the 40-hour training. But recently, she's starting to have her jailers go through the training because things are tension in jail, and she wants them to use these de-escalation talk down procedures in jail and have those tools also. So, uh, yeah. Of course, you know, so all of us, you know, if we get stopped by law enforcement officers, little, little, we tense up, right? You know, you know, because, you know, even if we got stopped for a minor, you know, uh, we creep through a stop sign. That's a natural reaction. And I know the law enforcement officers, and I drive fast, so I, I get tickets every now and then. And the officers I really respect come up and are, are very respectful, you know, not kind of using their command voice. In fact, a lot of times they even thank them for giving me a ticket, you know, because they just, they have these skills, they have this talent to be able to do their jobs right without, you know, making it onerous. So, yeah, you know, the, the more tools, the more uh, training you have, I think the better law enforcement officer you have and the safer your community is going to be, my personal opinion. And I think the sheriff uh, and the chief feel the same way. Well, substance abuse, of course, that's the biggest problem in any community is alcohol and drugs. And it just so happens people with mental illness, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, when they don't understand why they're having these feelings or depression or whatever, and they start drinking or they sm start smoking dope. So there's lots of co-occurring disorders. And uh, so <clears throat> what used to happen, and uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure about Illinois, but Texas doesn't fund substance abuse things. You guys accepted the affordable health care dollars. So under that parity bill that was passed by Senator Kennedy and his son Patrick, uh, you know, uh, uh, mental health and substance abuse services have to be funded and treated like any other illness. Now, they're not doing it yet, but CMS is aware of that, and there's going to be lots of pressure to actually fund these services based on the real cost and not some, you know, artificial cost that your Medicaid director has come up with because he wants to, you know, uh, limit the, the state's exposure, you know, for, for your FMAP, your, your state match. And uh, so, remember we were putting things on parking lots, I told you, that we couldn't fund? So we knew alcohol and drugs were a big problem, but we also know knew that if we allowed law first officers to bring people the primary diagnosis of alcohol and drug problems, we would be overwhelmed and our program would do terrible. We just, it would have blown up. So we had regular meetings to begin with to make sure law enforcement officers were bringing people with uh, persistent, uh, continuous and persistent mental illness to us rather than people that had a primary diagnosis of alcohol or drugs. But we knew it was a big problem, so we put it on the parking lot. And there was no way to fund it because Texas basically didn't fund alcohol and drug services uh, for, for a long time and just still recently. The only money that the state of Texas put in alcohol and drug services was they matched the money that the uh, SAMHSA had for the federal block grant. Most of those dollars are spent in the prison system, not on not on community alcohol and drug programs, although there's some. So uh, I had an opportunity to befriend a, a very powerful guy, a guy named Bill Grehe, who had started a, a company in Texas that ended up being a Fortune 500 company. He's very generous. And he started this homeless project, and uh, he was explaining the project to me. And, uh, you know, he actually he and his friends, he got his friends to put up $107 million to build this campus, which is absolutely phenomenal, incredible outcomes. You can't go on the campus unless you sign this transformational pledge that says you'll be alcohol and drug-free, and you'll work eight hours a day. 
Okay, so most people who are homeless, you know, uh, do have alcohol and drug problems and mental health problems. So anyway, he was explaining his vision uh, to me in the county judge's office. And I said, Mr. Grehe, your plan's not going to work. And, of course, uh, he's uh, one of these captains of, of uh, corporate America and very kind and very generous, uh, uh, most generous person I've ever met. And he looked at me like he wanted to cut my head off because I just told him something that he didn't want to hear. And he said, why won't it work? And I said, Mr. Gree, I'm sure you know in your research that the chronically and persistently homeless are people with mental illness and usually have co-occurring substance use disorders. We're already serving 2,000 more people than the state pays us for on the mental health side. Our staff's heads are about to explode. We can't you know, accept more people because there's just no additional capacity. And there's no funding for alcohol and drug treatment. And so he's very smart. He got it right away. And I just kind of read his mind like, well, damn, what do you expect me to do about it? And it just popped out of my mind. I said, Mr. Gree, why don't you use some of your corporate muscle and your lobbyists to help me go to the Texas legislature and get some money? And he did. They were in my office the next day. He personally went and talked to the governor, lieutenant governor, and the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, a guy named Ogden, who's an oil and gas attorney. Of course, this guy's an oil and gas titan. And uh, so I got $6.7 million. The Texas legislature meets every two years. So for the biennium, it gave me enough money to add the sobering and detox unit that you saw on the film. And for one year's operation only, they wouldn't, they wouldn't fund the services afterwards. So in that year, I had to keep a lot of debt on cost and outcomes and prove to the county, the city, and the hospital district that I was saving them a lot more money. And we actually did. We get funded by the county, the city, and the hospital district to keep those substance abuse services going. And, you know, I'll give you a good example uh, on the data. So here's what used to happen with public inebriates. Uh, you know, it's kind of cold here, so you probably don't have the numbers that we have. But we have bike police in downtown San Antonio, literally thousands of people who are there panhandling, sleeping in the parks. Um, uh, people in South Texas came from humble beginnings. They're very generous. And if they think somebody's hungry, they're going to take a dollar out of their pocket. They don't realize that that person's not going to spend that dollar on food. They're going to spend all those dollars they get on alcohol and drugs because they're going to go get their food at the shelter. <clears throat> and so uh, these, these people, uh, because they're uh, so uh, inebriated, impaired, uh, they have these strange behaviors, and they come in contact with law enforcement. Or they're aggressively panhandling. This is a tourist town. Uh, they're urinating and defecating in public. They're doing minor, minor thefts. They're passed out in the middle of the street. They're uh, criminal trespassing. They're sleeping on somebody's doorstep. So law enforcement has lots of encounters with these people, and they're really nuisance encounters. And so what would happen in San Antonio is these people would get arrested for whatever little dirty deed that they were done. And if this is America, if you get arrested, you're going to go for, through some kind of magistration process. So they would uh, go through the magistration process, get a fine for whatever they got you know, picked up for, which they never paid. Now, and this is not in jail, but this is the city drunk tank. So they get put in the city drunk tank, and they monitor them. And once they start sobering up, they let them go because they don't want them to go into convulsions and DTs and dying you know, in the, in the sobering tank because they've already paid some of those million-dollar lawsuits. They also know that if they pay to send you to detox, it's going to be a failed intervention because you don't have any place to live. You're going to ride back to the streets, and you're going to relapse and start using right again. So then they let the person out before they go into DTs. They walk right out of the door. They start panhandling and drinking and drugging again. So they might get arrested two or three times. The city of San Antonio at one point was spending $16 million on the magistration process alone. I don't know what it costs for the bike, bike pool police. A huge percent of that cost had to do with these inebriates. So these people are always impaired. They have no insurance. They wouldn't know where to go for help. They couldn't pay for it if they did. So Mr. Grehe got us this money. We opened up our little sobering and detox unit. Uh, we had beds in the detox unit one time. People were so inebriated, they were falling off and hurting themselves. So now we just have mattresses. Uh, we hired nurses. The nurses were offended by these people because, you know, they were throwing up and they came in with feces on them and all that kind of stuff. So we, we, we moved the nurses on to our outpatient clinics 
and hired EMS folks. And the EMS folks, they see the, uh, nothing you know, affects those men and women. And they actually treat these people with respect. Almost everybody that works on that unit are in recovery themselves, okay? And uh, it's not a, like a, you know, expensive detox unit. It's medically supervised. And so our staff are on their hands and knees saying, hey, I used to be thrown up like you and sick like you. On the other side of that wall is the detox center. Don't you want me to, uh, don't you want to go over there and get some help? I did. So about 20% of these people who have no insurance, who would have never gotten to a decent place, you know, they surrender. They say, yeah, okay, I, I, you know, I don't want to be sick all the time, and I want to, you know, have contact with my kids and my family again. So they, they go to the detox unit. Well, as most of you know, you have probably have family and friends who have been through detox lots of times. Detox is a necessary intervention that doesn't work too well. You know, just ask Lindsay Lohan and a lot of pe other people we see in the press who have been ordered again and again to detox. What's important is how you maintain your sobriety after your detox. So that homeless campus I told you about, the, that billionaire uh, put all that money in, it's an alcohol and drug-free campus. You also have to work at hours a day. So on that campus, we have two dorms, or large dorms, one for males and one for females. It's called in-house recovery. It's like sober living. And so once you get detoxed, you go there. So you're not tempted. It's a 90-day program, so your brain chemistry actually gets to start kicking in. Uh, you're sober long enough, you start figuring out what you've done to your children, your family, your friends, and yourself. You learn about your disease. You learn how to ma manage your disease. You're getting hooked up with AA and NA or whatever higher power you believe in to help you manage this. Uh, there's also a social network. We're working uh, on getting you jobs and housing. And I'm going to tell you something that you're not going to believe, but we have the data to prove it. A year after you go through that full course of treatment, sobering detox and in-house recovery, 60 to 70 percent of those people that go through the course, stay with it, are still alcohol and drug free. Many are living independently and working. It's a phenomenal program. And a lot of them, of course, have mental illnesses. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much what Am does. But but where where you you're fortunate now and in the timing's right is you all accepted the affordable health care dollars. So everybody we're talking about, all of a sudden are going to have insurance. So they can get their primary care taken care of. They don't necessarily have to die 25 years sooner than the general population. The benefit will also cover mental health and substance abuse services. And the managed care companies who will get punished if these people uh, tend to get rehospitalized over and over again, they're going to want to come and say, so, so most insurance companies in, in, in Medicaid and Medicare Right now, how they pay is for inpatient and outpatient services, right? And all the programs I just talked to you about don't fit that particularly. You know, intensive case management, the rehab services, these crisis services. So what's going to happen is the managed care organizations that the, your state Medicaid division are working with, they're at risk. But they also have the flexibility of, of coming up with creative solutions as long as it costs less than the traditional services, and you, you're driving the behavior around the triple aim. So you actually might get people to pay for these crisis services or short-term residential or, or uh, you know, uh, peer supports and other things that, uh, you know, haven't been funded now. So, you know, the, the stars are kind of aligning uh, in that respect. And, of course, it'd be great if you had a foundation or a rich uncle, too. Yes, ma'am. Instead of taking him to jail, and he did 
Yeah. So uh, that's an interesting question. Um, at first, even the bike police downtown San Antonio uh, didn't want to take people to the sobering unit. You know, they, they were, you know, law enforcement officers. You do the crime, you do the time. And it wasn't until a few of them decided to start doing this, and they actually saw that these people weren't homeless anymore, they weren't seeing them again, and the buzz kind of got around, you know, this treatment stuff really works, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, it's good, and I can actually not mess with these people all the time. I can start chasing the bad guys. And uh, so uh, uh, their tolerance for looking past some offenses continues to grow. Now, officers have discrimination. Now, if you get caught with a bunch of drugs or something, you're probably going to go to jail. But if you got a, a joint of marijuana in your pocket or something minor or something like that, maybe not. It's according to what officer, you know, uh, you know has has uh, contact with you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so law enforcement officers have discretion. I'm sure they have codes and they talk about this. You know, wh wh what are we going to you know, like? You know, I'm sure the 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 sheriff here has things that he just would never, you know, say. You know, it's okay to let that person walk. And the chief's probably the same way. Uh, but there may be other things that are kind of well. You know, if this treatment stuff really works, uh, you know, this is kind of you know black and white. Let's try it once or twice and. See how it works? Maybe. And I think that kind of phenomenon is kind of going on in our community. But if, if you commit a crime that where you need to go to jail, officers are going to look, look past that. You're going to jail. But what happens in jail is we have staff there. They're probably going to identify you with the medical staff. They're going to try to get you in treatment when you get out of jail. Uh, yeah. At the University of Illinois, we have a police training institute that trades the police outside of Chicago, the municipal police forces. Mm -hmm. Have you attempted to g get in the curricula of these people the ideas that you're talking about here? Because I think most of the young cadets feel they're police officers and not social workers, yeah. as you were saying. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. We, we're, we're in the academies doing the training. We actually work with NAMI and other family members and people in recovery that do the role playing. Can you talk a little bit about the conditional discharge and at what point, you know, if the law enforcement officers aren't dropping them off, how conditional discharge plays in and what those that partake in conditional discharge, what their crimes may be like or their illnesses? Yeah, so I didn't, did I tell you, I didn't tell you the story about how I can prove treatment works, did I? I told that to the other two groups. So let me, let me start off by telling you how I can prove to you that treatment works. Go to that slide that's got the 6.6%. That one. So uh, Texas's prisons in, uh, you know, uh, before the late 60s uh, were almost a profit center for the state, and most of the prison systems in the South were that way, and maybe in Illinois, I don't know. Uh, prisoners were forced to work. They raised all their own food, made all their own clothing, uh, they repaired school buses, they made furniture, they practically had no staff, they had what they called a building tender. So you took kind of the biggest, meanest, most dominant uh, person on the cell block and you put them in charge, and they reported to some subwarden, and uh, if they kept the peace, then they got good time or special consideration or food or whatever. Uh, the problem with that is there were a lot of wrongful deaths and the way they kept the peace was through beatings and intimidation. Uh, also, uh, so they practically had no staff, they forced uh, people to work, and they had no medical services. So if you were dying of cancer or some horrific disease, you just died this horrific you know, death uh, in prison because you weren't going to get any medical treatment, you especially weren't going to get any kind of drugs that would be painkillers or something like that. So there was a federal lawsuit, a class action lawsuit called the Ruiz case. The federal judge was a guy named William Wayne Justice. And to make a long story short, the state of Texas, to get out of this uh, federal lawsuit, 
in the resolution settlement had to agree to build a whole bunch of 1,200 bed prisons, a bunch of new ones, actually staff them with professional law enforcement officers who are well-trained and have adequate medical services. So Texas being the conservative state we are, we built all those prisons and we built extra prisons because we want to cuff and stuff everybody. We're a law and order state. Well, that worked real well until the bill came in, you know, and we're a low tax state and this cost billions of dollars and they had to pay for the annual operations. And so those extra uh, prisons we built, that extra space started filling up real fast. And our legislature started getting really upset because they didn't want to build any more and they had this federal judge looking over their shoulder. And so they had this researcher that worked for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice named Tony Fabello, Dr. Fabello. They turned to, to Tony and said, Dr. Fabello, tell us why the extra capacity in our prison system is being utilized so fast. And so Tony and his staff went and looked at the prop, uh, po uh, prison population in detail and he wrote this report for which our governor promptly fired him for because it basically said, you all are stupid. Uh, you got a bunch of people in prison who don't make good prisoners. Um, you know, and mentioned two groups, uh, nonviolent mentally ill offenders, felons, and people that were terminally ill that if they were out of the hospital wouldn't be in danger of themselves or others, and you can't be on Medicaid in the hospital anyway, and you can in a nursing home or a hospital. So uh, even though they fired uh, Tony, oh, by the way, uh, Tony is his famous consultant now, so he's making jillion dollars working for the United States and states probably has done work in your state and other countries. So the best thing ever happened to him was he got, he got fired. And he's actually working on our project with the, the, the uh, council of governments, that second diversion point. And uh, so, but what he did is in his report, he explained uh, mentally ill, Nonviolent people in prison don't make prisoners. They're hearing voices, and so it's hard for them to obey the rules, so they're in lockup a lot of times. Their behaviors make it dangerous for everybody else, so it agitates the other prisoners. Uh, if uh, 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 they're on suicide watch or they're in lockup, which costs a lot more, if their illness is finally identified, they're in one of those psych hospitals inside their prison, so it costs three or four times more than the general population. And because they get no good time, they spend their entire uh, uh, their entire uh, sentence in jail. And so he actually did a performa that said, you know, uh, if you don't go to the the hospital prison unit, it costs X numbers of uh, dollars a day times 365 uh, days a year, times the length of your sentence, and it's this amount of money. If you go to the medical unit, it's this amount of money. And so even though they fired him, he recommended that the criminal justice system develop a new unit of government, and they did. It's, it's, it's a unit of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. It's called the Texas Commission on Offenders with Medical and Mental Impairments. And so what they used to do, and, and, uh, and uh, what they used to do is go through the prison system, identify these nonviolent uh, uh, mentally ill offenders, and they put them on parole. A condition of their parole is they had to see my psychiatrist, take their medication, do their alcohol and drink, uh, drug screen if so ordered, and generally stay in compliance with their mental health treatment, okay? So people on parole, I'm not sure what it is here, Sheriff, but I think the national studies I saw, felons on parole, the revocation rates after three to five years was 40 to 60 percent. In other words, they you know, recommit a crime, they get rearrested and go back to jail or prison. If you have a mental illness, it's a little higher. So you can see this, this report comes from the criminal justice system in Texas, and it's the big mental health authorities. You can see there's 6.6 percent of the people that we treated who used to be in prison uh, have some kind of technical revocation. Most of those people, when they have a revocation, we round them up, get them back into treatment, get them back in front of their parole officer, they go back to jail and prison. So if you can find ways to get to people into treatment, they, they tend to do fairly well. This is the, mental, the, this, the criminal justice system in Texas paying me for mental health treatment, not the mental health system in Texas. And uh, there's a conservative think tank in Texas, and very conservative. They have this program called Right on Crime, okay? Very conservative Republicans, but they, they, they believe in this program not because they believe in treatment and doing the right thing. They believe in this program because it re improves the public safety net and it saves the taxpayers a lot of dollars. 
So they have been to your state and every state. You know, uh, people like the Koch brothers are supporting this. Uh, one of our conservative uh, U.S. senators, who I never thought I would hear say anything good about treatment, Senator Cornyn, has come out for right on crime. It's the right thing to do. And so, uh, you know, treatment works. You know, if you can get people to treatment, you find a way to get them to treatment, uh, then it tends to work and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, they can reclaim their lives and, and have a more productive and happy life and saves the taxpayers dollars. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, have you noticed any um, racial trends or patterns in the assessment of mental illness or um, the treatment of mental illness as well? And to add to that, um, if you have identified biases in the assessment of mental illness by racial ethnic groups, um, what have they have they been? Well, I, I can tell you that I met with Eric Holder in his office several years ago uh, because we uh, hosted the first international CIT training, and I wanted him to come and be the keynote speaker. Well, he couldn't, but he, he taped something for us. And I had in my hand, when I went to see the Pew Charitable Trust Report on the criminalization of people in the United States. And this was several years ago. You can look it up. One in 99 people in the United States at that time were either on probation, parole, in prison, or jail. That's considerably more than any other country in the world by far, if you want to look at it per capita or the actual numbers. So we're actually criminalizing people. If you look at the demographics behind that report, that the, by far the largest number of people in jail and prisons are people that don't have access to treatment or good attorneys. If you look even deeper around the ethnicity, the majority of those people are minorities. And so if you don't have access to health care, you don't have access to, to, to uh, uh, good attorneys, then you tend to, to, to end up in, in uh, more true restrictive places. So yeah, I think there is a problem. I'm proud to say in, in Bear County that uh, we're uh, very, uh, uh, well, I don't know what the right word is. I don't want to say colorblind because it sounds like there was you know, uh, 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 we have such a diverse uh, population uh, that it's, it's not a problem and it hasn't been. In fact, uh, even though 16% of our population is uh, African American, we have the largest Martin Luther King march in the United States. We had 60,000 people. And of course, we're mainly Hispanic uh, community. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't have the same kind of racial tensions that a lot of big cities have. So it's not an issue for us. So is parole what you're referring to as conditional discharge? And then the follow-up question that I have, you mentioned crisis residential. Do you have numbers about how many per night are served in crisis residential or an average census? Sure. So uh, remember, we didn't have any money, so we didn't want to have like a, a psychiatric emergency room. We did this little crisis unit, and we were 23 hours, so we had to do this position in 23 hours. And so uh, since we didn't have a lot of money, we couldn't stick everybody in a hospital. And everybody doesn't need to go to a hospital. And so what we found is only about 20% of the folks brought to us actually need to be hospitalized. So uh, we assess people while they're there financially to see if they have Medicaid or Medicare or private insurance. And we also at that point try to get people on benefits. And our county hospital actually has a program called CareLink. So if you're not eligible for Medicaid, you're probably eligible for CareLink for the working poor, and they actually have a, a mental health and substance abuse benefit. And we have lots of, of uh, step downs that you know that would have been uh, considered alternatives to hospitals. So we have two 22 bed facilities for the chronically and persistently homeless, one for males and one for females. We have crisis respite. We have short-term residential. That homeless campus I told you about, a huge number of those folks have mental illness, and we provide the supports around that system. It just costs a few bucks a day. It's not very expensive. Uh, if you won't sign the transformational pledge to go onto the homeless campus, because remember, you've got to be alcohol and drug-free and willing to work eight hours a day, you're on another part of the campus, and it's called Prospects Courtyard, and I operate that. And we have six to 700 people a day that go to that. So why wouldn't you want to go to a campus of, that looked like a college campus where you get all these enriched services and they send you to nursing school and welding school and, and all that kind of stuff? 
Yeah, and actually, people a lot of people sleep outdoors in the area that I operate on mats. Even when we treat people with dignity and respect. So the reasons that you wouldn't go and sign that transformational pledge is you're so hopelessly addicted to alcohol and drugs, you can't believe that you would go someplace where you couldn't get it. So a lot of those people, you know, are really addicted. They have, you know, they can come to Prospect Scoreyard, they can't bring their drugs with them, but they can come in impaired. We have lots of security, we have lots of people in recovery that work there. We do a lot of motivational engagement. In fact, over the last uh, four to four and a half years, we've moved over 4,000 people into treatment off Prospects Courtyard to the place where we got them stabilized uh, psychiatrically or got them off alcohol and drugs where they would sign their transformational pledge. Uh, uh, so that's one reason. The other reasons are you're, you're uh, uh, so mentally ill that you just, you don't know how to navigate the system and and you can't make good decisions for yourself, so you're not going to sign the transformational pledge. The third reason is you're a sex offender, and the average age at the Haven for Hope is 12 years old, and so you're not going on that campus. But we provide a great service to the community in the fact that these people aren't sleeping in the parks where they'd be tempted or the public would be at risk. And once they get in our program, we start wrapping services around them and getting them jobs. So a lot of these people are working nights and days in construction. They're starting to build money, you know, uh, start, you know, pedophiles. You know, you all know pedophiles are snow hope. You know, we should just put them in a jail or uh, an institution and leave them because treatment doesn't work for them. But there are a lot of other uh, people that get uh, 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 charged uh, for sex offenses that are treatable. And, uh, you know, uh, people that have sex with, you know, 15 or 16-year-old girls that are 19 or 20 years old, uh, some incest cases. There are other people. So, we, you know, we have some, some cases there where people are treatable. But a lot of people are working. They're productive citizens. They're not a risk for themselves and in the public. So, uh, you, know, it, you know, it's a good reason. But uh, we, we made appointments in our outpatient clinics for people with mental illness. They just never showed up. They were so sick and dysfunctional, even though we were giving them taxi vouchers and, and uh, bus passes and making appointments in our outpatient clinics. So we plopped a psychiatrist right down in the middle of them. And most recently, remember these people die in Texas 29.4 years sooner than the general population, so their health is terrible. And uh, CMS wrote, uh, uh, gave an offering for uh, health care innovation grants three years ago. And so we wrote a grant. There were 6,000 applications in the United States, mainly from large med schools and big hospital systems. And we were the first one to get funded because our goal was to take primary health care, disease management, and prevention to this very sick, ill population that was sleeping outside. So now we have primary care there, and it's an integrated setting. So you have psychiatry, uh, primary care, and alcohol and drug services in the same place. Uh, CMS has been there, the Medicaid Medicare Administration. Their auditors have been there th three times. The last time they came, they brought a film crew because our outcomes are so as outstanding. They're going to feature us in the next meeting they have in Bethesda, Maryland. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and that's what, you know, our community just came together and, you know, these are problems. How can we find ways to fix them? So we just keep hammering away and trying to, to do that and, and uh, make a difference. So I'm not trying to brag about our programs. I am trying to brag about the, our community collaboration and how we come together and work together and identify problems, and we just don't take no for an answer. Sooner or later, we're going to find a way to make things better. It may not be perfect. That's the reason they call it continuous quality improvement. It may not be right. If it's not right, we keep a lot of data on cost and outcomes, we change it. You know? And uh, I'll tell you a story. Uh, uh, back in the uh, 80s, if you remember, uh, our United States auto industry was about to go bankrupt, and Toyota and, and uh, all the Japanese companies were just killing us because the, the quality of our cars were terrible. And so, actually, the, the head engineer of Toyota you know, uh, uh, invited the Chrysler engineers over to go and see their continuous quality improvement you know, program, you know, their quality circles. And they let them actually head up one of the assembly lines and I can't remember the, the engineer's name, but so he would go to, to uh, his engineers who are working with, with their, their employees in the Toyota plant in San Antonio. Guess how many times a day their employees come up with ideas about how to improve their products? A thousand ideas a day. 
every day. Yeah, they have a board and they're always working on, on an improvement. So uh, the engineer, and this was a long time ago, like I said, you know, in the, in the early 80s, he would go to his employees and say, how's it going? And everybody would start chattering, oh, there's a problem here and we think we could do better there. Then he went to the Americans and asked them how it was going. And they said, oh, things are going great, no problem. And so by the end of the week, he heard it one more time and he got frustrated and he looked at the head engineer from Chrysler and he said, no problem, big problem. And so, you know, you got to be willing to say, you know, this crap doesn't work. You know, yeah, you know, we got to try something else, you know. Yeah, you know, we you know, got to be honest with yourselves, you know. No problem is a big problem. In fact, I have a T-shirt I wear when I go talk to my employees. And I say, do you know of, of things that we're doing wrong? Do you know of things we could do better? Do you know where we're wasting money? And, uh, you know, I tell them this story, you know, I said, I expect you to be speaking up and being part of this improvement process because we're all about improvement. You know, no problems, big problem. Sorry about that. I keep hearing you talk about the success of the treatment and everything. Um, we got treatment centers around here. Where do you get the detox money? The question, I mean, you can't go into treatment unless you detox. You got, yeah. the first step is getting everybody off the drugs and the alcohol. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't make myself clear earlier. So when we first got some money from the Texas legislature for two years to start our program, then within that two years, we had to prove to the local community that the program is so successful that they would continue the programs, and they have. So we actually get money from the city, the county, and the hospital district to continue those programs because they save a lot more than that uh, uh, in other, other ways. How long well have you worked with your local uh, NAMI affiliates? How have you done that? And then also, um, do you use peers talked about the EMTs and the fact that they had been in the same position as the people that you were bringing in. So that's kind of like a peer-to-peer -peer support. Uh, do you use that in any other uh, area? Yeah, so, for, so first NAMI. Uh, we work closely with NAMI. We support NAMI. We have a network advisory com uh, committee that uh, we appointed that's different than these other uh, uh, committees because we have networks of providers like like uh, 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 Pete has, except what we do is we let these family members and business people in the community decide the value. So, you know, if public dollars are involved, we want to make sure if we're putting some out for bid that we're getting the right uh, people that can d demonstrate the right outcomes. And if they can't, a lot of times they suggest that we continue to deliver the services ourselves. And uh, so uh, it just so happens that when I first got there, we laid off a whole bunch of our staff because they were terrible and they weren't treating people in dignity and respect. They weren't available and we had a terrible system and it didn't take people long to figure out if you want to work here, you actually have to make a difference in people's lives. So we've kind of turned our, our culture around. Uh, uh, we're still very underfunded. And so uh, there are probably NAMI family members who want additional services that we don't provide. And I was telling the earlier group today, we actually uh, kind of, uh, of uh, prioritize the services. So right now, our community collaborations, we decided we want to work with children and adolescents at risk on the early ons onslaught of mental illness. Then we wanted to work with people in psychiatric crisis because we didn't, you know, ethically we didn't feel it was right for, you know, people to have to languish on the streets or be in jail or, or die, you know, 29 years sooner. And I actually had a board meeting, a member of one of my last board meetings said, you know, Leon, why, you know, why are we spending money on all these people in crisis when we have all these other people that uh, are, are uh, needing services too, you know, uh, but aren't in, in psychiatric crisis? And I wish I'd thought of this, but I didn't, but I thought of it later. So uh, kind of what we've done, you know, we're, we're the, you know, uh, you know, the Coast Guard, and we come up on a ship that's overturned, and there are three people in the water. Uh, uh, two of the people are swimming and can tread water, 
and the other person's gone under for the third time and we have a lifeline, who do we throw it to? So we've had to prioritize our services because of that and we feel terrible that we can't meet all the needs in the community. So there is some tension between NAMI and us and the fact that we are the mental health authority. We feel responsible for it, but our funding just won't allow us to do everything. But again, we have that on the parking lot. We're working with the legislature right now to try to increase our per capita funding so we can do more in these other areas. I, I would like to ask this question. What do you do with the uh, mental patient that's uh, violent? I heard your program don't take, take them in. Where do they go? Yeah, so that, that film actually is uh, incorrect. Uh, almost everybody that's brought by law enforcement officers uh, many times are shackled and very upset. It's just the law enforcement officer and we are really good at talking people down and de-escalating. So most of the people, unless they're knocking down walls and totally outraged, we take. We, we reject very few people for, for behavioral reasons. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, have you observed, it sounds like that you've made some good inroads with law enforcement. Um, and I'm wondering if the operation of your program has affected uh, practices of prosecution and sentencing as well. So that's one question. Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah, it has. In fact, 50% uh, of all of our state hospital bed day utilization are for forensic commitments. And because the judges have seen that treatment works and they might get somebody who didn't get referred by us, but the person comes before their court and they can tell there's something wrong with the person. And so the judges many times are, are saying, I want this person to go to the state hospital on a forensic commitment because I want a good psychiatric evaluation so I can have more information before this, this trial proceeds and I want to make sure they're lucid enough where they can work with their attorney in their own defense. So, uh, uh, and our judges are very supportive of all the restorative courts, what I call therapeutic justice. So the drug courts, the veterans courts, the mental health courts, the children's courts, um, you know, uh, are, are generally supported by uh, the judiciary. That sounds so, great. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not perfect, but you know, when words getting around, this treatment stuff actually works. Well, that leads into my other question, actually, which is um, I'm curious about your staffing. Uh, how, like, do you have the community doing research for you? You've got staff to do research? Um, yeah, so a little bit of everything. Uh, when we write federal grants and stuff, there's usually a research component, so we, we uh, work with the university or the med school for the research. Uh, we, we take research very seriously. So I've actually written grants to hire medical economists to a medical economist to ind independent cost benefit analysis because um, like the the county manager uh, he just doesn't want to believe that this is saving him any money. In fact, uh, I speak all over the United States. I was asked to go to Richmond, Virginia uh, recently, and I was talking about my program, and a medical economist that works in their medical school came up and said, Leon, how do you get people to pay you for early intervention prevention? And, uh, and, and so uh, let me tell you what happened. So once we started our diversion program, our county judge, the champion, the person that made us do it, come together and brought the first group together. He said, Leon, he said, this program is working really well. He says, does the county give you enough money? I said, no, judge. He said, well, go ask for some more. And so I did. I put a proposal to expand programs and do some of those things in the parking lot. And uh, the uh, county administrator, whose job is to protect the commissioners and, the, and uh, the county judge from overspending, he told me, no, we're not doing that. You can't prove that you know, these diversion programs are actually keeping people out of jail. So I went around to each one of the commissioners and the judge, and I said, I'm going to shut the program down for 30 days. Everybody's got at least 30 days vacation. And if your county administrator's not coming and begging me to open it back up, I will quit my job. And I meant it. I was dead serious. And I kind of indicated that if I wasn't right, if I was right, that the county administrator probably should quit his job. Well, I got my money. <laughs> okay. But uh, anyway, this medical economist sent me an email later, and it's in my office. 
And he said, Leon, you should have a plaque in your office. Thank you pay for paying for something that I can't prove. And so early intervention and prevention, you know, and it's, it's kind of back to the values I told you before. You know, our consumers and our families and the people on that first group, we decided that, you know, if you hadn't committed a major crime, we, we don't want you to go to jail in the first place. In fact, there's a lot of research that ever, say, ever that says if you ever get put in jail in the first place, your chances of going back to jail are increased considerably. And uh, the, the sheriff and I were visiting last night, Monoma County actually built a new jail. They're trying to sell to Hollywood, that's Portland, trying to sell to Hollywood for a prop so they can do movies and series in their jail. Big, beautiful new jail. Their, their original jail is like at 80% capacity, and it's the bigger one. That's the reason they, they didn't move to the smaller one. But here's what they did. They, they, uh, the community elected a new county attorney, and what she did is she put her, her most skilled staff at bookend, at magistration, and they do a dangerousness assessment, and if you don't score high on that dangerous assessment, they, send you, they give you a court date and they send you home. So what happens in Texas is the bail bondsmen there are so powerful, they give so much money to elected officials that when you get charged with a crime, the judge pulls out a sheet and says, for that crime, it's 30 days in jail or a $500 bond. And so a lot of these people make minimum wage, they can't make the $500 bond, they languish in the jail, they lose their job, and they got two, three little kids at home, and do you think they're gonna reoffend? Probably. And they're, you know, they're labeled as, 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 as a criminal at that point. So Monoma County's been doing this uh, four or five years now. Actually, they have data and research that shows that the public safety net has actually improved and people are, are doing better. And so, I mean, you know, there are things you can do, right? Your community can come up with ideas that are pretty creative and that actually might might work. And if it doesn't work, you try something else. But uh, yeah, they, they, they quote uh, that research a lot in Monoma County about being criminalized in the first place and it kind of puts you in a path that uh, you, you shouldn't be on. I've got a question. Uh, how do you interact with the faith-based community in your in your city? Do they assist you? Do they uh, provide funds for you? Um, what kind of um, interaction do you have, if any? Well, we have a healthy relationship. Uh, in fact, we've uh, uh, worked with uh, different churches and doing screenings and training in churches. Uh, we just developed a mental health app. And uh, that, that, you know, I was asked to go to Aurora uh, Arapahoe County a year after the shooting in the theater there by one of the county commissioners and as a young woman she's a psychologist now she's got a PhD in communication but she's a, a county administrator one of the county commissioners and she wanted me to come and talk about what they could do to maybe identify uh, you know people that have illnesses and get them in treatment and, and do early enrichment prevention and uh, at one time I'm the past president of the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities Directors so I know a lot about the Virginia Tech shootings. I know a lot about the Loftner kid in, in Arizona and the shooting in the Naval Yard and, and the drive-by shootings that happened in California. And, and uh, uh, it just dawned on me when I was in Aurora after talking to the sheriff after my presentation, he came up and he said, you know, Leon, he said, you know, once I started investigating this, he said that young man was gonna be a brain scientist. He knew there was something wrong with him. He was very smart. And he became sick, his roommates actually moved out because they were terrified of him. The psychiatrist he was seeing at the, at the college thought he was gonna kill her. He said that night, after it was all over, the next morning, early in the morning, I called his mother, and she said, yeah, you got the right guy. And the same thing with Virginia Tech, you know, the 26 people that got shot or whatever the uh, number was, their family knew, roommates knew. The guy actually got before a judge who, in order him to to treatment, he never showed up, and the judge didn't know about it. And so, uh, you know, that day I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we had a mental health app that explained the signs and symptoms, would have resources for people to do, would also be a stigma buster. Uh, and uh, so we've, we've done that. In the last two years we've developed an app, it's called Mental Health U, for Mental Health University or Mental Health in U. And uh, we're going to take it uh, to middle schools, junior highs, high schools, businesses, 
and teach them how to use an app. So if you have a son or a daughter or a student or a friend who is exhibiting behaviors, this will tell you what to do. And probably a trained law enforcement officer is going to show up, even maybe with a mental health professional, to do an evaluation before the person hurts themselves or somebody else, and your loved one or your friend's not going to get shot. Uh, so when you, you go to the App Store, you can see it. We're doing the Android uh, portion of it. In fact, uh, we were talking about it last night. You all could use it here and brand it as this county's you know, app and take it to junior highs or high, high schools. Then it's got an area, should I be concerned? And if you're concerned, you can go get more information or you can press 911. It'll take you straight to dispatch so you can get some help right away. Uh, it's got... Uh, a section of famous people that had mental illnesses, so you don't feel like, you know, just because you have a mental illness, you're, it's necessarily bad. It's uh, got all the things that people say when they, you know, just snap out of it, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it links to all the research uh, that's going on in the United States, uh, you know, in uh, clinical trials. Uh, but it's very uh, user-friendly, and we hope it'll be a good tool to help people get early intervention and services. And uh, so uh, we're, we're uh, real close to, to rolling it out. Don't call the crisis number. And if you do, if you hit the crisis line, it will take you straight to my number. But it costs me $17 every time somebody calls. So <laughs> so if you call, to, it's going to say crisis line, but they're going to charge me $17. So please look at it, what, what, whatever. Uh, if, if you all are interested in it, uh, you, know, uh, you can put all your own crisis numbers, all your own resources. Branded as, as uh, your app for your community, uh, that would be good. We know, uh, you know a lot of communities have already talked to us about doing that. Yes. Hi. Um, I like the idea of the app, except for a lot of the families that you know, we have talked to certainly are, know the signs and symptoms, know that they're mentally ill, know that they're a danger to others, and they simply can't do anything or can't get the courts or anyone to make it, them do something about it. And I like your you know, diversion program where it's a fast track back into if they help. I mean, if a fast track back into the hospital if they um, you know, are starting to be dangerous, or, or right. not even dangerous, but not taking their medication. Right. And I'm the administrator at Public Health, and we have something called uh, directly observed therapy. And that means that if someone has TB or an infectious disease, we can mandate that they take that medication to prevent spreading tuberculosis because the theory is that they are a danger to others uh -huh. and um, they're a danger to the public so we can put them on quarantine or isolation if they're actually sick and have them take the medication. And in this county, certainly, we have had amazing um, results working with the state's attorney and, and when someone was noncompliant then we were able to go in and do something. And I have always wondered, because I am not from the mental health world, but I have always wondered why there is not directly observed therapy for persons who have been adjudicated and, you know, they're, they're back out and their families are exasperated and they need help. Why can't there be a program of directly observed therapy to, to make them continue to take the meds? In our case, we literally send a nurse to the home check every day, do that. It is very expensive, but it's not nearly as expensive as a case of drug-resistant TB, nor is it nearly, in the case of mental health, it wouldn't be as, as expensive as hospitalization or you know, constantly abusing the jails. Right. So I think that it's kind of not fair to say that families don't know that the, that the situations are going on, but truly, if they, I have heard examples of calling and calling yeah. and calling yeah. and calling, yeah, they and they cannot get the help. Yeah, no, I, I agree, or they don't know what to do. Uh, so uh, that's right when we do the conditional stuff I told you about the courts and stuff because we do have people that don't even know they're sick or they're uh, treatment resistant or they have cognitive problems or, or you know they don't have family and friends that are reminding them to take their medication or see the doctor so that gives us some uh, legal uh, process because it's conditional uh, where we can go in and, and uh, you know assist people and be a little more assertive uh, otherwise, if it's voluntary, you know, we can't trample on people's rights. And uh, I know there's a bill uh, in Congress right now being sponsored by Representative uh, uh, Murphy uh, from Pennsylvania that the NAMI folks are working on that would uh, really require the intensive outpatient programs I talked about be mandatory in all states and also uh, do away with the IMD rule. 
And so uh, right now, if you have a facility over 16 beds, you can't build Medicaid. And uh, the IMD rule, and the, and the reason I had that is because you know, the, the federal government didn't want to support institutional care and have states just warehousing people and having the feds pay for it. So I can understand why they did it. So in his bill and what we've been promoting is that you could only have up to 60 days so you could develop these crisis centers and have short-term residential impact interventions and respite uh, for people um, and help them maintain their good mental health and their tenure in the community. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic as a rule, but I really feel like some of the things are kind of aligning around big payers and starting to look at outcomes rather than process. And you know, So I'm hopeful for the next few years. Yes, sir. So uh, this all sounds good. What's the next steps for our communities? What's what's well, what do we do next? Well, I, I think you're already doing it, and you're already t uh, talking about it. So what what I would do is I would get the key players in the community together, and I would sit down and map out everything that you have now, and do an inventory. And uh, you already have a lot of great programs; they're just not very well connected. And uh, maybe they're not dealing with the, the priority population. You know, you know, who are those folks you really want to spend your public dollars on first as you're trying to build resources for other people? So, uh, you know, you can even do a spaghetti diagram. And I told a group earlier, not this last group, but the, I think the group I talked to you yesterday, <clears throat> my parents went to Europe twice. And the second time, my mother was just thrilled about her trip. And I said, well, you went to different countries? And she said, no, we pretty much went to the same countries we went to the first time. And I said, well, you went to different cities or museums or cathedrals? She said, no, we pretty much saw the same things. And I said, well, what's so special about this second trip? And she said, the tour guide. And I said, tour guide, what does that mean? And she said, well, the first time, you know, we're uh, most older folks and we have diet problems, and ambulation problems, and lugging our luggage around. and." And, uh, you know, potty breaks or clean restrooms are important. And we we're sticking stuff in our ears and being rushed from one place to another. So that this time, the tour guide made sure that all of our needs were given to her before we even arrived. Our luggage magically appeared uh, in our rooms. If we had special diets, that was already taken care of. She rode the bus with us and was explaining all the magical things and the history of the cities and stuff. Uh, we had scheduled potty breaks, and my mother says she knitted all the treasures of Europe together, the tour guide. So you have lots of treasures here that aren't necessarily all knitted together, right? You know, if I was a community, I'd sit down and do that inventory and, you know, figure out who the key players are and who's going to make us, you know, do better with what we have. Then you can start plan, uh, planning on the Medicaid expansion and those new resources and, and uh, your partnerships and, and those kind of things. So I, th I think they're you know, logical things that you can probably do that will make a big difference right away. Just getting to know each other and trust each other, you know, makes a big difference. So uh, I'm an enrollment assistor here in, in the county, and so the main problem that we see um, is that there's not enough private practice and access to actual care. So the waiting list is like eight months to one year in the hospitals. So how were you able to kind of meet that demand yeah, so uh, we, we haven't totally met it, but uh, I started tackling this pro problem a long time ago. So there's a huge shortage of providers uh, across the United States, especially psychiatrists. So one of the things that we've done is we decided that for every doctor that we have, we would have four uh, extenders. So either physician extenders, extenders or APNs that will work under the doctor. So that increases your, 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 your capacity greatly. And so you're getting good medical care and good oversight. And what I found is APNs and PAs are really good, you know. And I, I hope there are no psychiatrists in the room, but there's a lot of them are as good or better than our psychiatrists. And in fact, some states are, I think your state's one of them, they're even looking at maybe even letting psychologists, you know, if they go through a medication Medicaid training, you know. so. Uh, we also use telemedicine and, uh, you know, uh, other kinds of, of supports. Uh, well, but we still struggle, you know, uh, with that issue. Uh, but I can tell you that we're the public system. And if you see a try to see a private psychiatrist in, in Bear County, 
you're going to wait, you know, four to six months to get your first appointment. If you're in psychiatric crisis today, you're going to see a doctor that very day. Now, if you're in one of our outpatient programs and you walk in, you know, you're going to see somebody that's going to help you today. It might be a psychologist or somebody else, and you may not see the doctor for, you know, 30 or 60 days, but it's not going to be four to six months. So, Leon, we're meeting our two-hour coming up here in a little bit, and there's a lot of questions, a lot of good conversation. So what question aren't we asking you? What is it that you need to tell us here before we part for the day? Well, I, yeah, I think the reason we're successful is, and I said this earlier, and I hope I've said it over and over again, you know, our success comes out of our community partnership and investment and goodwill. And, uh, you know, what, what you'll find is once you start working together, lots of great things are going to happen. And it's, uh, it's all about, you know, uh, you know that, that collaboration and, and being honest with each other, you know, having good information on what's working, not working, having a good plan and good leadership. So, uh, you know, I can tell by the three groups I've met with so far, you've got that, that spirit here. Uh, you've got a big university, so you probably have access to, to uh, you know, uh, resources for research and maybe grant writing. I know you're already, what did you tell me, you're writing three or four grants right now. You're, you're writing them, right? So you've got all this great leadership in the community uh, already. It's how you harness, harness that and uh, make sure that all the uh, errors are aligned and you're all in that tug of, ro uh, tug of war rope pulling on this side and you're not tugging against each other. And uh, that's really hard because, you know, uh, I was, I was uh, telling Pete that uh, I saw Patrick Kennedy and uh, Bill Emmett uh, uh, is a guy that works for Patrick Kennedy, and he's going across the United States hosting these uh, community uh, collaborations around reducing stigma and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, promoting uh, primary health care along with behavioral health. In fact, he was in Chicago when I spoke at Loyola Law School a few months ago. And uh, I think uh, a guy named Sullivan there, who has a restaurant in Chicago, his son uh, committed suicide, has severe mental illness. And but uh, Bill Emmett uh, in Washington D.C., all the advocacy groups, all the folks that we work with closely, they cut each other's throat. If it's not their advocacy group's idea, then even though it's the right thing to do, they don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, if they don't get credit for it, and so they're going behind each other. You know, really, undo and of course, the leg you know, the Congress and the legislature would love not to fund these programs. So if there was controversy, that gives them an excuse not to do it. So a few years ago, this Bill Emmett guy who uh, ran NAMI in Rhode Island and became good friends of uh, Patrick Kennedy, they elected him to kind of head up all of the advocacy groups in a united effort to press, you know, through with the. Uh, you know, the, the, the parity bill and a bunch of other mental health legislation. And Bill's got such a winning, uh, you know, uh, uh, personality in such a persuasive way, he was able to get all the advocacy organizations to kind of speak with one voice. And when that happened, magical things, you know, started happening. So, you know, you know if you have naysayers in the group or whatever, all of you need to gang up on them and, you know, <laughs> ma 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 make sure that they, they get in line. That would be the one thing I'd want to say. And by the way, we do lots of, we do hire lots of peers. We actually hire them. They're not volunteers. Last night you had talked about the CIT training that you had done with a lot of officers, and you had mentioned that almost half of it, I think 20 hours of the 40, were directly in role play. That's do, you, do you have a specific curriculum or a curriculum that's shared? We do. In fact, we developed the first curriculum in the United States for school police. And uh, uh, it's become so popular, and, and we do it in the summer, that uh, the vice principals are disciplinarians and a lot of the counselors have gone through the training. And, uh, yeah, we can, you know, send me an email. We can you know, have somebody get in touch with you. We'll get you that. All right. So if folks want to reach out to us um, after we're done, you can get a hold of Peter Tracy at the Champaign County Mental Health Board, email him, or you can email the sheriff, and that's a simple one at sheriff at co.champagne.il.us. 
and one or all of us will find a way to incorporate what you're willing to do or talk about into in our discussions. Leon, I want to thank you for your time and uh, your your passion in this effort here and uh, and for visiting with us and, and uh, look forward to our sessions in tomorrow. And thank you for everybody who came today.